Welcome to ES310 Lesson 30. Today we will be looking at conservation of momentum methods for solving rigid body kinetics problems. More information about this topic can be found in Hibbler's Dynamics Textbook, Chapter 19, Section 3. Conservation of momentum for rigid bodies is the same as conservation of momentum for particles in that it applies only when impulses are zero. So any forces are either small or act over a very, very small, a short time compared to other forces. The conservation of momentum then says that both the linear and the angular momentum are conserved. So the system's linear momentum before a collision or a change is equal to the system's at linear momentum after that change. The same is true for the angular momentum, so the system's angular momentum before is equal to the angular momentum afterwards. A couple of quick comments on rotational momentum. If there are forces on an object that create linear impulses but happen to pass through the center of gravity or a fixed point on the object, then the rotational momentum is conserved but the linear momentum is not. And so we have this equation that is applicable whereas these are not. For a general point, you can write the angular momentum as the IP, so the moment of inertia at that point, times omega, plus a distance in the y direction times a linear momentum in the x direction, plus a distance in the x direction times a linear momentum in the y direction. Let's take a, couple, a look at a couple of examples of conservation of momentum. In this case, we have a man who's sitting on a swivel chair holding two weight with his arms outstretched. And somebody starts him rotating at three radians per second, and then he pulls those weights in towards his chest so that the radius changes from 2.5 to 0.3. He's going to start spinning faster, and we are to determine how fast he ends up spinning. We're given his weight and his radius of gyration about the z-axis, and we're given the two five-pound weights that he's holding outwards. So from his weight and the radius of gyration, we can find the man's moment of inertia to be mass times kz squared. So then his moment of inertia when he's holding his hands outstretched is going to be, so that's I1, is going to be IZ, his own moment of inertia, plus the moment of inertia due to those weights, there are two of them, and the moment of inertia due to each, if we're treating it as a particle with a mass of MW, would be MW times r1 squared and r1 is equal to 2.5 so if we plug in numbers here we get mkz squared this is mass of the man plus 2 times mass of the weights r1 squared mass of the man is 160 divided by 32.2 kz is 0.55 squared plus 2 times 5 divided by 32.2 times r1 squared, 2.5 squared. This becomes 3.44. Now after he pulls those in, we still have the same expression except r2 is going to be 0.3. So i2 is going to be the same thing m man kz squared plus 2 times m weight r1 r2 squared r2 is 0.3 so we plug in numbers and we get 1.53 so as expected the moment of inertia for the man when he's pulled the weights in towards his chest is much smaller than the moment of inertia of the man when they're outright so now our conservation of momentum says that h1 is equal to h2. h, for this case, he's rotating around a fixed axis, at z, is going to just be i1 times omega1 is equal to i2 times omega2. 
I1 was or omega 1 is given as 3 radians per second, so we get 3.44 times 3 is equal to 1.53 times omega 2. So omega 2 is equal to 6.745 radians per second. So in this case, we have a change in momentum because we have a change in moment of inertia. And our angular momentum is conserved. So now let's take a look at another example. In this case, I is also going to change, but it's going to change because it changes location. So we have the plate, which initially is spinning around its center of gravity, which here is here in the middle. And it's spinning with an omega-1, and then it gets caught on the P and starts spinning around the P, point P. So we have two moments of inertia again. Ig is equal to one half, twelfth of the mass times a squared plus a squared. If we look at the back of our book in the table, that's the moment of inertia for a thin square plate through an axis perpendicular to its area. And then we have Ip, which is Ig plus mass times the distance squared, where the distance goes from G to P. So here's G and the P is at the corner. So this distance, D, is equal to the square root of 0.5 squared plus 0.5 squared. So if we look at our square here, we're looking for this distance. So this, the side is 1, so this is half of 1, and this is half of 1. So this then, by Pythagorean theorem, is the square root of 0.5 squared plus 0.5 squared. So if we plug in that, then we get 1 12th mass times 2a squared plus mass times... 0.5 square root of 2. And this is 0.5a. So that's 0.5a times the square root of 2. Um, and that whole thing is squared. So we can simplify this then. This is 1 12th mass, sorry, 1 6th. 1 6th the mass times a squared plus this is a half squared is a fourth times two is a half again so this is plus one half m a squared so this then is equal to a half is three sixths so this is four sixths m a squared this simplifies as 1 6th m a squared. So now we can, we can write our conservation of momentum equations. We have h1 is equal to h2. Initially, the h is ig omega 1. And if after it gets caught on p, it's ip omega 1, 2. And so we get 1 6th mass a squared omega 1 is equal to 4 6th mass a squared omega 2. The 6ths cancel, the masses cancel, the a squareds cancel, and we're get left then with omega 2 being equal to 1 4th of omega 1. In our third example, we're getting a little bit more complicated. And what's happening is we have a block that's sliding along the surface and it hits this little box at S and it tips over it and lands on the other side. And we're supposed to figure out how fast does it need to be moving at a minimum for this to happen. And so there's two sections of this problem that we're going to look at. First, the box is going to hit S and start tipping. All right, that's a conservation of momentum problem. So we have a, a momentum, it's sliding, 
Um, and even though it looks like translation, just like with a particle that's translating, when it hits a point where it starts to rotate, we can write a rotational a momentum. And that's equal to an I omega as it rotates around its corner, D. So that's conservation of momentum. We also have conservation of energy because as it goes from being um, on the ground to being upright, it's gaining, it's changing kinetic energy into potential energy. So we're going to look at this in two parts. We're going to start actually by looking at the conservation of energy, which will tell us something about the omega required. And then we'll look at conservation of momentum to determine the velocity from the omega. So if we're looking at conservation of energy, we know that TA plus VA is equal to TB plus VB. Now what do we mean by A and B? So A is this block right after it collides with the, with the box at S. So that's this box. And it's hit, it has hit A or S already, so it's starting to rotate. And it's going to rotate upwards, and if it's going to flip all the way over, it has to rotate up to at least the point where the center of mass is directly over, is directly straight up in the air. Okay? So in doing that, then the center of mass changes from HA to HB, and we can write each of those H's. HA is just half of the way up the box, which is 0.5. So HB is simply the diagonal of this box, which is equal to the square root of 0.5 squared plus 0.5 squared. So those are our two H's. So initially we have a kinetic energy. It's starting to rotate. So that kinetic energy is one half I D. It's rotating around this point, the corner, times omega squared, plus a potential energy because its center of gravity is H A above the ground. So that is the mass times the gravity times HA. Afterwards, if it's if we're looking at a minimum case, right, so this just gets so that it's st standing upright with no kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is zero and potential energy is MGHB. So we can now solve for omega, but first we need to find ID. So ID for the square right? We have I around G plus mass times distance squared. So the distance squared is the diagonal from the center to the corner. IG for a, a thin plate, if we treat that as a, this is a thin plate, is 1 twelfth mass times 1 squared plus 1 squared plus mass times this distance, which is the square root of 0.5 squared plus 0.5 squared, the whole thing squared. If we plug in all of those numbers with a mass of 10 over 32.2, we will get 0 0.2070 as our ID. Plug in ID over here, we get 1 half point two zero seven zero omega squared plus mass times G is the weight, that's 10 times HA is 0.5 is equal to 10 times the square root of 0.5 squared plus 0.5 squared. And we can solve for omega to be 4.473 radians per second. So the block has to be rotating right after the collision with an omega of 4.473 in order for it to flip over the little block. 
Now the question is how fast did the block have to be moving in order for it to start rotating at 4.473? So that's a conservation of momentum problem. We're going to look at H1, which is right before it hits the block, being equal to H2, which is right after it hits the block. So H2 is easy. H2 is ID times omega, and we know both of those things. H1, the block is moving with a velocity, so to get an angular momentum based on a linear velocity, we take the, ang the, the linear momentum times r. In this case, r is the distance, the center would be right above s, so this is r, so it's 0.5. So we get mass, which is 10 over 32.2, times the unknown v, times 0.5 is equal to 0.2070, which is id, times 4.473, which is omega. Solve for v, and we get 5.96 feet per second as the minimum velocity that this block could have to be moving at in order for it to flip over. Anything less than that, it will hit it, lift off the ground, but then fall back.